kind of explain the FAFSA as like your nosy aunt that mm. like wants to know everything. And so uh, opting out of verification is a great way to be like, I'll see you at Easter, Aunt <laughs> Sally. Today, we pick back up from our conversation with Jeanette Rojas. If you're a grandparent, stay to the end to hear some of Jeanette's insights on how grandparents can creatively help with their grandkids' education. So I think this, in terms of the distribution, raises um, an interesting issue. Sometimes Jeanette will have clients who will be saving, you know, in a variety of different ways for college for their kids, and they're not really sure how much they're going to need to save. They don't know, you know, as, as they start to save you know, even if their child might be interested in college. So one of the strategies sometimes that we'll use is that a portion of the savings will be in a Roth IRA. Now, I think to your point, you know, if they take a Roth distribution, even if it's principal and it's not taxed, it's my understanding that in the FAFSA, it's still recorded as a non-taxable distribution and that gets, gets added to income, which then mm -hmm. has an impact there. So what we've tended to do is encourage people just for a year or two of a college expense to do that because it's a two-year look back essentially to a tax mm -hmm. return. So maybe just for their junior or senior year, they could use those Roth distributions, whereas, you know, maybe they use a 529 for, you know, other years of distribution. So it sounds like that kind of jives with this whole thought process that, you know, we, we start and we're going to file our FAFSA in October of 2023 for school year, October, 2024, but we're looking back to 2022. Well, you know, we, we've got a time lag there that sometimes we can take advantage of if we're, if we're thinking about some of that, that planning process. Um, and obviously that's not for, that's not a situation everybody faces, but as okay. we kind of sequence this and how FAFSA that's, that's been our understanding of one of the ways that we can, we can give people a little more flexibility because if they save to a 529, that's never going to end up in mom and dad's retirement account. Mm -hmm. um, but if they save towards a Roth for a portion of maybe the need, then that can be a, a good strategy. So it, are, are we are we lined up there with kind of the, the, the wisdom of uh, that you'd have with respect to how we fill out a FAFSA and how we do planning? The other thing I've seen mm -hmm. is... Um, and you have to be pretty smart on that. I wouldn't do this on an unsubsidized loan because it accrues interest while you're enrolled. But mm -hmm. I've seen young people take out the subsidized loan and then mm -hmm. pay it off mm -hmm. their senior year with that Roth 529. Uh, yeah. Because your senior year, you're not applying for the FAFSA. Unless you're going to graduate school, unless you're doing something else or mm -hmm. do, it's taking six years. But I would think about that final year. And so you could carry those subsidized loans. This gets into like parenting and guardianship, but families say like, Hey, I want you to maintain this GPA and take mm -hmm. out these loans. And then when, upon graduation, there's an agreement of we will, and it, and it's a win win because then the student is responsible and anchored and feels mm -hmm. there's a little bit of, for lack of a better term, like skin in the game for them mm -hmm. to go to class, to take, to graduate <laughs> in X amount of years. Cause you know, college is fun. I might want to change my major last semester, senior year. I, I've seen it all. Um, but having that as kind of a safeguard can also be strategic for both the terms of college affordability and then college completion. So let's make sure that we understand that parent and student make this kind of covenant together. You take out the subsidized loan and there's zero interest on it. And mom and dad or grandparents or aunt and uncle, whoever are going to help pay off that unsubsidized loan when before interest starts. But after they've seen that student has done what he or she needs to do, uh, mm -hmm. this, you know, they, they, they've been wise, they've been diligent in their studies. That's great. And it would I, be the subsidized loan, because you said unsub, it would be the unsubs the subsidized for the not interest. Yes. And the subsidized is eligibility dependent based mm. off of the FAFSA and the student aid index. So there right. could be a world in which you are not qualified for the subsidized loan. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you could be making interest payments while you're in school. Studies and research have shown that students that work part-time and take out loans actually have um, better time management and mm. better college completion rates because there is that sense of responsibility and buy-in. That strategy is research-backed of the, if it takes four to six years to graduate, we've seen the, the young people that work part-time have a little bit of loans 
are can graduate closer to that four year mark because they there's this urgency and buy in for the young person. When you see money leaving your bank account because you have to pay interest, it makes me a little bit more aware that I should probably continue to go to class and continue mm -hmm. to go to work. I think that raises a couple questions with respect to you know planning for families. So if we've got let's say we've got three siblings and they're all four years apart, really what there, there's not a period there where um, we can kind of, you know, do that Roth planning, for instance, because mom and dad, if they take a Roth distribution, then it might not affect child A, but it'll affect child B. So it is that kind of ongoing, you know, nature of it when we've got multiple siblings, they're going to be filing potentially, you know, that family could be filing FAFSA for 12 years. And flags is, if I back up when you do the FAFSA, Mm -hmm. You log in with your FSA ID, the student mm -hmm. puts in their information around their high school, their 10 universities that they want to go to, they determine parental guardianship custody, and then it kicks over to the parent's information. And mm -hmm. in that, you can do the IRS data retrieval tool. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it connects to the IRS and it pulls the information from your taxes for you. And the mm -hmm. way that it does that is you have to match the address exactly to the address you put on your tax forms. So if hmm. you live on drive and put lowercase d, r, period, it has to be lowercase d, r, period. But it is beneficial because it opts you out of being federally verified where the FAFSA and the university can come back and ask for more information like W-2s, Schedule Cs. I kind of explain the FAFSA as like your nosy aunt that mm. like wants to know everything. And so uh, opting out of verification is a great way to be like, I'll see you at Easter, Aunt Sally. <laughs> After you do the IRS data retrieval, it can it kicks to the next section, which is typed in around checkings, alimony, savings that isn't pulled from your IRS data retrieval from your okay. tax forms. Because there's, there's two sections around mm. this financial shop snapshot. And in that section, back to the scenario of four of three kids, 12 years of FAFSA, is it asks for your household size and how many people are living in your home. And mm. it accounts for that. And that is also reflected on your IRS taxes because of your um, who you're claiming as dependents, which it gives you that mirror. The household size is important because you might have a multi-generational family where you might have an elderly parent, like a grandma, mm -hmm. living with you that isn't reflected on your taxes, but you mm -hmm. are responsible for them. And so that is a place where you can claim them in your household size, which I think is nice that that is reflected in the FAFSA and gives families a, a chance to explain that unique situation. And so that is for that scenario of you have three kids four years apart where the when the oldest is completing the FAFSA, it will look different because you will have a household size. If you have two parents, three children, mm -hmm. that's a household size of five. Mm -hmm. But then when you have your youngest, that's a household size of three. And so that income disbursement, that financial aid snapshot is different. One way that I help families kind of plan is through the net price calculator. Universities have these. Uh, Vanderbilt has my favorite. Um, it's super user-friendly and you can do this at any point in time. And it's the soft equivalent of a FAFSA. And mm -hmm. what it does is you put in estimates of your financial situation and you put in your family size and it gives you an estimated um, index and a kind of a goal of what you're saving for. And then you can kind of play with that scenario as if you're a family of five versus a family of three and see what the difference is. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I really like about Vanderbilt as a university is that they will fully meet need. So if you are a full Pell eligible student, which means you have an expected family contribution of zero, Vanderbilt will cover the unmet cost, which is all of tuition and fees. If you have an expected family contribution of 20,000, 
Vanderbilt will meet up into that mark on tuition. So then it gives you a really clear sense of budget and they are a need aware university. Again, universities change their policies all the time, but Vanderbilt has a long standing legacy and tradition and that the way that they package students, which I think is helpful in having families like that scenario of 12 years of FAFSA plan, how to support their their young people. And I think that comes back to a general reminder that what the FAFSA is doing is it's showing colleges and universities what a family can expect to contribute. So that's why they ask questions about what do you have saved? What is in your checking account? It asks the student, what do you have? What they're wanting to surface is if you had to go to college tomorrow, how much money can you bring to the table? And so it's not just the federal government that looks at it. This is universities that look at it as well. Yes. And so universities, state and private use this to um, do need-based scholarships. Need-based scholarships can be based on if you're a first-generation low-income student. That is a great example where they might have additional scholarships. So that's need-based. And then there are non-need-based um, scholarships. And so that could be depending on your ACT or SAT and GPA, you might get the presidential scholarship. And that's $2,000 a year every year that you maintain a C or above average that you complete the FAFSA. And that is based off of your academics. Another example that is not tied to the FAFSA could be um, student athletes. So if you are getting um, a scholarship for swimming and diving, that is not tied to your FAFSA. They might use your FAFSA to say, you know, we should give them X amount because we see their expected family contribution is Y. Why? It helps with the equation. So that is an example of where you might not be eligible for federal aid, but your mm -hmm. university may use it to give you that academic scholarship or that athletic right. scholarship that isn't tied to need. So it's really important, no matter where you are on the financial spectrum, to go ahead and fill it out. Because even if you do have resources, if the university like Vanderbilt is far and above what you can contribute, you might still get a, a good bit of either scholarship or need-based aid from the university. So I think that's a really important piece, especially for some of our higher net worth clients that they say, well, it, it doesn't matter. I shouldn't fill this out because we're going to be able to pay everything. You don't know what you're going to qualify for and what you're not going to qualify for. So taking the time to just say, hey, we're going to spend however long it takes to fill this out, it may actually be beneficial in the long run. What I advise is that I actually recently did this four years ago with a family that I was working with. We sat down, we did their net price calculator. They had a significant expected family contribution. And so what that empowered that student to do is take as many AP and concurrent college classes that they could. So they just graduated this year as a senior and are walking into their state university with a year of college mm -hmm. credits, saving that family a year of that expected family contribution. Right. So that knowledge is powerful, not only for the sense of your senior year in planning, but you can then look at the your high school experience and plan accordingly to save money because you know you have this EFC. You know, paying for four years of Vanderbilt can be expensive, but if you're walking in with two years of college, that's only two years that you have to pay. And then you get that bachelor's degree with that prestige or same with UT. There's ways to take that knowledge and plan, not only financially, but within the academic structure of your high school mm -hmm. to really prepare you for an affordable bachelor's degree. So Jeanette, if we kind of think about this logistically, we've got a family, let's just say that has a daughter that wants to go to college. They work on the FAFSA, get it done by Halloween. She's a senior in high school. They have a sense maybe of, of what aid might be possible, but then that's gonna go out to 10 different universities. And let's just say, you know, it goes to 10 of those. How many of those universities typically are going to reach back out and they're going to have more questions, you know, about the um, applicant? Is that mainly private universities? Is it also a lot of public universities? How does that work? And then what's kind of that process? When when will they know or are they only going to receive that that information, that package after the student has been accepted? Or what's what's kind of our logistical path there? The FAFSA is the first step in the mm -hmm. financial aid process. So a high level like senior year timeline is you come into school in the fall. You start working on your college essays. You complete your FAFSA in October. And then I guess I love holidays because the other thing I tell students is by Thanksgiving, you do not get pie 
unless you've applied to all of your universities and colleges. <laughs> so FAFSA is on Halloween and before Thanksgiving, usually the day before, um, because they don't have school. And they are applying to all of their colleges and universities. So simultaneously as a FAFSA is being set, so are the university applications. So they get those together because you might have schools that are need aware and take and factor in a for um, ability to pay and affordability to their admissions process. So you want those to be done simultaneously. In December, your students will start to get a student portal accounts for, I went to the University of Denver, it was Pioneer Web and I got a nine digit number that I memorized and had to log in and it would show me red flag of what it had flagged on the FAFSA. So it was asking for W-2s, household size, and every university has the option to flag you for verification. Mm. Um, and they can and will ask for different things. Now here is my, cause again, FAFSA is your nosy aunt, Sally. So the thing that you can do with those 10 universities is you have your student get their portals, log in and see what forms. You're gonna need a scanner and some patience because every form is different and tied to the university's letterhead. So they will ask the same thing such as household size, but it will be different for UT and different for CSU and different for DU and different for Harvard and different for Columbia. And you'll have to print and fill it out and scan it for every single university. So pour yourself a cup of ambition and, and jump <laughs> right in. Um, and so in my classroom, I used to have two scanners because it would, we would just, you just had a scanner party. And the caveat is of that is do not send that form until the university asks for it. And the way that they will ask for it is very passively in the student portal with a mm. red flag. So your student has to know that after I apply and I'm told I am accepted, I need to log into these university-based websites and everyone has their own login, everyone has their own code and see what they're asking for. So if you have a parent that is like, we're gonna figure this out, we're gonna print all these forms, we're gonna be ready, and they send them to the university before the university asks for it, it automatically flags them to be audited, mm. to be verified. So you wait until the university asks, and then you send it out. And so you would do that, I would say, December, January, February is when students are doing their student portals, we're having scanning parties, and then by spring break, I would say in February by Valentine's Day, if you're not starting to see financial aid award letters, um, I tell my students that if for Valentine's Day, you are, Cupid is not sending you financial aid award letters, you need to get on the phone. Because um, that's by, what Cupid does. Yep, Cupid sends you money, at least your senior year. And so you should be getting those financial aid award letters between Valentine's and spring break in March. And by May 1st, May 1st is National College Commitment Day. So that is the day across the country that universities have an aligned deadline where students declare where they are going. It's usually a fun day. It's exciting. Um, but to get us to May 1st, I would say by the latest mid-March, you should have all of your financial aid award letters so that you can sit down as a family and start looking mm -hmm. at the cost of attendance and your different options. Like, okay, UT gave us this $3,000 scholarship, but CSU has out-of-state tuition and they're willing to match it for in-state. So that saves us 10,000. And then this private school is giving you $20,000 scholarships, but they cost three times as much. And then we have to buy plane tickets. So that's where you have those really granular in the weeds budget conversations between March and May. And so to get there, Halloween, you do your FAFSA, Thanksgiving, you apply to college, Valentine's Day, you're getting your award letters. By spring break, you're starting to have those family meetings. So that I mean, first, you can declare where you're going um, and have that that joyful day. And then when nosy Aunt Sally asks you at your graduation party where you're going, you can say. And so that's kind of an overview of the timeline of senior year. And then it's really fun after your freshman year, because then you only have to deal with one financial aid office, one scholarship program. Oh, goodness, I missed another holiday. So the other deadline that is important is universities have internal university-based scholarships. Some are need-based, some are major-based, some are interest-based. 
Um, for example, my major was Spanish and anthropology. And one year I got a Spanish scholarship because I applied to that department's scholarship. Mm -hmm. So every department, um, like business schools usually have scholarships, small scholarships, large scholarships, and you can apply to them once you're accepted into the university. My rule of thumb is March 1st is usually the deadline for those scholarship applications, but sometimes they are in December. So you have to know based off of your university and they are called internal scholarships and they are tied to the student's account. So they have to be admitted usually um, to apply for those scholarships. CU Boulder is an example where you do not need to be admitted to the university to complete their general internal scholarship application because their deadlines earlier in the year. So if you're going to go play for Coach Prime, but walk <laughs> on, you got got to know this. So Jeanette, we have lots of grandparents that want to be involved in helping out, but they also know the FAFSA is really complicated and maybe some of their actions could impair, you know, financial aid. Can you give us maybe a rundown of anything that comes to mind that we want to help grandparents understand to avoid doing if they are helping with financial aid, but maybe this this actually doesn't help it? You know, you, you, you get hit with something that's an un, unexpected bill or consequence or unintended consequence there. Um, as we work with grandparents as they're trying to help, what, what would you say to that? I think using 529s to put in grandparents' name with grandchildren's as beneficiaries is something transparently Austin and I talked about, but the, I think that that is a good plan. The other example is paying the university directly is also helpful for tuition and fees. Um, there's no, my understanding is that there, there's no connection there. It is when it's paid to the student for school. The other scenario would be that that covenant, as I liked how you said that, Spencer, is you could enter that with the grandparent of mm. saying like these tuitions, like we'll cover your first two to three years. The thing I would add for grandparents to be mindful of is that there is a bigger pot of financial aid resources your freshman year, your first year of college, than your junior and senior year. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. less funding available. And so really that is when the scholarships are. The other thing is unpaid internships. And so a way to support that is non-traditional is I had to take um, student teaching to become a teacher and student teaching is unpaid and it is a full-time job to get my degree to become a teacher. And so I could have benefited mm. from someone and like I did it, like I just worked evenings, but th another, like any unpaid internship or any summer program, like if they want to intern in DC for the summer, most of those internships are unpaid. And mm. they, and that is a creative way I've seen for generous grandparents to support. And that can look like rent, that can look like flight, that can look like any of those things. Another example is uh, studying abroad. It can be a very transformative experience. I know it was for me. Um, and things like paying for the plane ticket or passport or different aspects of that because tuition can be more to study abroad as well. But I would say the 529, the recognizing and being strategic of 529 placements and entering a covenant to um, take out loans and pay them back, I think would be wise. But there are also other creative ways specifically around internships that I think generous grandparents could support. And it sounds like one of the, the ways that that can be even most helpful is if the grandparent actually pays you know, for the expense rather than the, than the grandchild, because then there's not a gift to the grandchild that then is, you know, there's a paper trail and all kinds of different things. Yep. But if it's, a, if it's a direct payment, then the student never had those funds. It, it can't even really be categorized as a gift. And I think if I'm correct, that while there's an annual gift exclusion, a grandparent mm -hmm. can give anywhere up to $17,000 to a grandchild, you can directly pay for tuition without limit. And so that's really a, a tr tremendous benefit if you have grandparents that want to help with college, if they pay the university directly, those mm -hmm. annual gift exclusion limits where you have to report to the IRS, those are lifted if you pay direct to a university, which is a really nice benefit to a grandparent. 
and to a student. Okay, so we're kind of running up on time and just want to finish off by saying thank you. I think we could continue talking for a long time. I think there's questions that we could continue to raise because there's a lot that goes on in the college admissions, the college financing process. As you think about next steps for people, and as you think about what if they walked away from this with one thing, what would you want people to walk away knowing? The FAFSA is truly the first step in affording college, and it is a snapshot in time that if does not reflect your current reality, you can advocate for adjustments. That it is not black and white, and you can work with your university. There are lots of scenarios and reasons why, and so I would use the FAFSA as your first step in making college affordable, but just as that, as a step, and that to work with in the relationships of your financial aid office at your university to advocate um, to make college affordable for you and your family. Well, Jeanette, we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you for bestowing us with all of your FAFSA wisdom. If you want to learn more about Jeanette and her work and how you can get in contact with her, visit her at yourproudtia.com. Clients, if you have questions about the FAFSA or college affordability, please feel free to let us know at our next client review. and We would love to talk about it with you. As always, we look forward to seeing you again soon. If you like these financial planning videos, please share it with a friend. And if you have questions, go to our website at seriousretirement.com. This content was provided by Retirement Planning Services. We are located in Knoxville, Tennessee. You can visit our website at seriousretirement.com. The information in this recording is intended for general educational and informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advisory, financial planning, legal, tax, or other professional advice based on your specific situation. Please consult with your professional advisor before taking any action based on its contents. Advisory services offered through Retirement Planning Services, LLC.